Hi and welcome to this video looking at the shapes of polyatomic ions or polyatomic molecules. The shapes of polyatomic ions or molecules are worked out using the valence shell electron pair repulsion rules. These are the VSEPR rules. To work these out, you take the number of electrons on the central atom, you add one electron for each atom which has been attached, then you minus the charge if it is an ion. You then divide that number by two to work out how many electron pairs you have around the central atom. This will allow you to work out what shape you have. If you have lone pairs, they can be found by taking away the number of atoms which have been attached. Lone pairs or non-bonding pairs of electrons have a big impact on the shape of a molecule as they have more repulsion than bonding pairs, which we'll come on to later. I'm going to fill in this table here to show you the pictures for each of the shapes that we have and explain how those shapes arise. Another really good resource to have a look at is the Compound Chemistry website where there's a really great infographic that you can look at which explains more of the valence shell electron pair rules. If we look at the first one here we've got two bonding pairs and no non-bonding pairs. This leads us to have a linear shape. So if our central atom is M, we're going to have two bonding pairs and they're going to get as far away from each other as possible. So 180 degree bond angle there is as far away as they can get. If we have a trigonal planar, if we've got three bonding pairs, again, it's going to try and get as far away from each other as possible. So this time you're going to have a 120 degree bond angle. So you can see here, this is as far apart as those atoms can get. For four bonding pairs with no bonding, uh, no non-bonding pairs, we get a tetrahedral, which you'll have seen when we've looked at something like methane, so that's what I'm going to draw here. So this is where you've got a carbon and four hydrogens. We tend to draw this with the 3D shape, so we put in a wedge and a dashed. So this shows one H coming towards you and one going backwards. Here we have around 109 degree angle. Another one that you might have looked at is pyramidal. This is where you've got three bonding pairs and a non-bonding pair. Now, it comes out as a very similar shape to the tetrahedral. It's just that you don't have one of those bonding pairs. And the classic one that we look at is ammonia. So you have the three bonding pairs here to the H's. And again, I'm just putting in the 3D shape there. And then you have this lone pair on the top. The lone pair on the top propels more than a bonding pair would, say in methane. So that means the bond angle is slightly less in ammonia because it's um, pushed down due to the bonding pair. Nonlinear or bent would be for water. So this is where you have your central atom oxygen. We have two bonding pairs trying to get as far away from each other as possible. But at the same time, we have two lone pairs at the top of the oxygen here pushing that bond angle slightly smaller than we would expect because we have those two pairs on the top. If you have five bonding pairs and no non-bonding pairs, we have to try and get those five atoms as far away from each other as possible. We do this by making something called a trigonal bipyramid. So you have two atoms which get 180 degrees away from each other. And then you have three atoms which are all 120 from each other and 90 from these two axial ones here. So this maximizes the amount of space that they have and they get as far away as they can and we call it a trigonal bipyramid because we have these two pyramids formed by this uh, equatorial plane here and the axial ones at the top and the bottom. If you have six bonding pairs, and this is one of the most common ones, um, especially for your metal complexes that you might look at for unit one, we form what we call an octahedral. So we have all of the atoms at 90 degrees to each other. So you form a square of atoms around the middle, and then you have these two going um, above and below. The final one we're looking at here is square planar. So this is where the non-bonding electrons really come into play. If you have two non-bonding pairs of electrons, they will try and get as far away from each other as possible because they take up the most space and they're the most repulsive. So it looks quite like the octahedral, except you're, you have this lone pair at the top and the bottom. 
and that means that the atoms which are bonded form a square around about the metal. So you really just have to take into account where those non-bonding pairs of electrons are and how they are interacting with each other and with the bonding pairs. Let's look at a few examples and see if we can work out what their shapes would be. So here we've got NH3, NH4+, and AlH4-. We're going to go through the different steps to work out how many electrons we have and therefore what shape we have. So for NH3, our central atom is nitrogen, which has five electrons. We're going to add one electron for each atom which has been attached. So we've got three, and we don't have a charge, so we're doing minus zero. So that gives us a total of eight. If we then divide that by two, that gives us four electron pairs, which I'm just going to write here. Four electron pairs. And if we take away the number of atoms which are attached, so we've got three atoms attached, that leaves us with one lone pair. We now need to arrange these so that they can get as far apart from each other as possible, taking into account that we have a lone pair. So that means that this shape for ammonia is pyramidal. If you were asked what the shape of the electron pairs are, that would be tetrahedral. So you do need to really carefully read the question as to whether they're looking for the shape of the electron pairs around the central atom or if they're looking for the shape of the molecule itself. If you're looking at the shape of the molecule itself, then you're ignoring those lone pairs. You can't see those, so you're just looking at the shape of the atoms. If we look at NH4, we have nitrogen again, so we have five electrons. This time we have added four atoms onto it, and we do have a charge, so we're going to do it minus one. So that gives us eight, and we're dividing by two to give us four electron pairs. We have four things attached, which means we have no lone pairs in this one, which means that the shape of the molecule and the shape of the electron pairs is tetrahedral. And finally, looking at the aluminium hydride here, so if you've got aluminium, this has three outer electrons. We have attached four things to it. And it has a charge of minus one. So if you do minus, minus one, that gives you eight electrons in total. And we're dividing that by two to give you four electron pairs. You have four things attached, so there's no lone pairs. So again, the shape of this one would be tetrahedral. Here's eight examples for you to try. Remember to work through the steps, flip back to the page with the shapes if you need to, and pause the video now. Let's have a look at these examples. So for the first one, we've got sulfur hexafluoride. So sulfur has six electrons in its outer shell. We are adding on six atoms and no charge. That means we have a total of 12 electrons around about the central atom there and if we divide that by two we get six electron pairs. We've got six atoms attached so we've got no lone pairs so this must be an octahedral molecule. If you have a look at boron trifluoride. So for boron we have three electrons, we're adding on three atoms and it has no charge. So we've got six electrons in total and if we divide that by two to get our electron pairs, we have three electron pairs and no lone pairs. So this one is trigonal planar. Looking at a different sulfur compound, we have six electrons plus four atoms attached and no charge. So that gives you 10 electrons. If you divide that by two to get the electron pairs, that gives you five electron pairs, but this time we have one lone pair, if we take away the four. So one lone pair. This means that we are trying to put five electron pairs around about the sulfur, but only four of them are bonding, so it means it will be based on a trigonal bipyramid. What actually happens is you'll have your sulfur with the four fluorines attached in this way as this gives the most space for the lone pair here. 
but it is based on a trigonal bipyramid. If you look at beryllium chloride here, so we have beryllium which has two electrons in its outer shell and we are adding on two with no charge. It's going to give you four electrons and if we divide that by two that gives you two electron pairs so we're going to have a linear situation there. Looking now at some ions, we've got iodine flu fluoride here with a negative charge. So iodine has seven electrons, we're taking that as our central atom. We're adding on four fluorines. And then we have a charge of minus one, so we're doing minus minus one, which gives us a total of 12 electrons there. We then divide that by two to get the electron pairs. So if we divide by two, we get six electron pairs, but we've only got four things attached, which means we must have two lone pairs. So we have six electron pairs, which would arrange themselves in an octahedral arrangement. However, you've got these two lone pairs. So like I said, they'll try and get as far away from each other as possible, which means that the rest of the iron will be square planar. If we have a look now at this I3 minus ion, so if we take one of the iodines to be our central atom, we'll have seven electrons. We're going to add on two for the two that have been attached to it, and then we're taking away the charge. So that gives us 10 electrons in total. We're then going to divide that by two to give us five electron pairs, so we know that the structure will be based on a trigonal bipyramid. And if we take away the two things which are attached, that gives you three electron pairs. So we are trying to arrange something in a trigonal bipyramid arrangement where we've got three lone pairs and two bonding pairs and we're trying to get things as far apart as possible. So this will in fact become a linear molecule. I'm gonna draw that out for you. So you would have iodine bonded to these two other iodines and then you'll have these lone pairs as far away from each other as possible. So they are 120 degrees from each other, which is the optimal arrangement for them. You wouldn't have one here and the iodine here because then you've got lone pairs which would be at 90 degrees to each other, which would not be optimum. So in fact, this is linear if you ignore the lone pairs. We have a look now at ClF3. So chlorine is our central atom with seven electrons. We're going to add on three for the fluorines. We've got no charge. So that gives us 10 electrons around a central atom. If we now divide that by two to give us five electron pairs, and we're going to take away the three things which have been attached. That gives us two lone pairs. For two lone pairs, again, we've got five electron pairs in total, so it's based on a trigonal bipyramid. Two of them are lone pairs, and they're going to try and get as far away from each other as possible. So if we draw this one out, you'll have chlorine, and then you'll have the three fluorines around the centre with the two lone pairs, one above and one below, so 180 degrees from each other. This means that the shape of the molecule itself is a trigonal planar molecule. And the last one that we're looking at is pH3. So P has five electrons. We're adding on eight, three H's and we have no charge. So that gives you eight electrons in total. We're gonna divide that by two to get four electron pairs and then take away the three that have been added. So that gives you one lone pair. So we're based on a tetrahedral, but we've got one lone pair. So this is going to be similar in shape to ammonia. So this will be pyramidal. I hope that you found this video looking at shapes of molecules and using VSEPR rules helpful. Please remember to subscribe or follow me on Twitter at Miss Adams Chem for regular updates.